the level of understanding when you start talking about things like SEO or um, uh, digital advertising or uh, machine learning, it suddenly you get such discrepancies at different levels because people people never knew this who were in, a, in very in, in very important positions to make investment decisions. So I think you know how do, how do we survive the tsunami? I think it's um, going to require a lot of learning through a whole organization. I think that's where partnerships play a role. Not only is it getting done, but it's also bringing um, appreciation and understanding that yes, um, this type of stuff is possible in an organization. We felt it would give us the best access to the strongest possible group of senior insurance decision makers. InsureTech Insights is a must-do conference, I think, for the network that is built here. As discussed in the brief introduction, today we are trying to, to discuss a little bit more about what is taking to winning consumer over. So I'd like to start the discussion with you guys talking about if you think it's actually possible to love an insurance company, because I, I feel that is not always the case. So shall we start with you, Monica? What do you think? I mean, you heard maybe Amanda this morning who said, uh, it's, it's not that easy to deal with this. Yeah? Is it easy to go from a relatively low trust level to a higher trust level? Yes, I believe we can do that. And one of the examples I have is uh, here my UK colleague, Sue Richard, big applause. <coughs> Because the UK team managed to get into customer satisfaction index from place 188 to 12, yeah? And we are talking about cross-industry cross industry index, and we are now in the same space as Amazon uh, and John Lewis, and I think that's a big applause for the UK team. Yeah? Uh, and of course the question is, how do we do it? Yeah? And one of the things where people really get into trouble with us is, uh, do we pay out claims? And I think uh, this, this clever focus and communication on 99% of our claims are paid out was one of the reasons <laughs> how we gained trust. And we get into an emotional space which is much higher than we had before. And if you look at the details of the customer satisfaction index, there are different levers you can pull in. One of them is emotional connection. And there we are now on place seven. Yeah? So it, it is really good. Yeah? So you can do it. Insurance doesn't have to be something where people go, oh my God, is this the only thing we did? No. I mean, one of the things I'm very passionate about is also looking at customer journeys uh, and fixing the basics. I'm a huge fan of innovation, but if you don't fix the basics and people have to wait too long until we answer, uh, and Inaki just had a good example of if you go to a broker who still works with paper, it takes you two weeks to get insured. People today want to have a one-click experience. Yeah? And my daughters that are 20 years old would never, I mean, never come to the conclusion that it takes two weeks in order to get an answer from an insurance company. So yes, you can do it. Uh, you can be very clever in your communication, but at the same time, you have to fix the basics as well and have to be very clear about the customer journey. Andrea, what do you think? I think that that's really our goal, uh, but there is still a, a huge gap to be filled. The first half of the gap starts from trust. Mm -hmm. I fully agree. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, Edelman Institute. It's a research institute which every year performs very deep analysis on trust. It's free if you Google Edelman Trust Barometer. You will find uh, all the sector, all the industry in a ranking, 18 industries. Number one is technology. The last one is insurance. And this also partially explains the success of insurance tax. It just yep. combined the, the top and the, and the last one, huh? and you create a new industry. Uh, so the point is why. I agree claims is part of the, the reason, but to me, there is a, a higher reason. Uh, in, in a certain way, we lie. There is a mismatch between what, how we present ourselves and how the customer perceives. We call our <coughs> products home protection, health protection, but if you have a health protection, this doesn't prevents you from getting sick, mm. no? So we just come after the damage. But we present ourselves as an umbrella. If you Google insurance, click on images, you will find out a lot of umbrellas. But you use an umbrella because you don't want to get wet. So we are more like a towel which comes to dry you up out after you get wet. No? So, uh, so the point is, if first we have to recover the trust, becoming the umbrella. 
Yeah. So to protect for real. The second, I think we have to stop speaking to the brains of our customers. We, we, we sell insurance as a P&L balance share between <laughs> premiums and claims. This is not the way. We have to speak to the heart of our clients, of our customers. When you buy insurance, uh, you feel comfortable from the day one you bought it, not after you claim. So uh, just to give an example, we created um, an emotional checkup. So it's an insurance checkup which doesn't tell you what you need. It tells you what you want. So try to analyze the personality of the clients to see what are they fear. And so we, we, we tell our customer how to cover their fear, not their real needs. There is another way of approaching that. But in the case, if you cover the fear, the customer is comfortable from day one mm. and not at the end of the journey. Interesting. And what about uh, your point of view, Thomas? I think I'm pretty much with you. Um, we need to get from a selling uh, perspective towards a buying one. Um, and I mean, it's interesting, uh, even today we are talking about uh, customers. In every other industry, you would talk about consumers. And talking about consumers means talking about buying. Someone wants to buy something. And then you get attractive, and um, then you can love the product. Uh, we are coming from a selling perspective, talking about customers. And um, I think there we need to, to start and change. And that's coming then from the offering perspective, which is product and pricing for sure. At the very end, um, it's, it's a claims part. Um, for me, um, as a marketing guy, um, the brand is also a critical element in there. And I think, um, or what I always say is, we need to get our brands Instagram ready. Um, consumers think totally different today. And um, I don't uh, think that insurance brands to date differ. Hardly they differ. And um, if you want to get into a buying approach, um, then brand is one key element beside offering and at the very end, uh, the claims handling. Makes sense. Stefan, your point of view? Uh, I, yeah. Can I be provocative and ask a question? Please. Do we still need brands today? Because customer experience is so important, so brand might be something where you don't have to focus upon in the beginning. It's a good point, Monica. Yeah. I think there could be a separate discussion on that, but um, yeah. I think there will be a shift uh, in uh, brand perception, um, especially uh, how people consume brands today. And maybe it's not, um, it's not an overall brand, um, and maybe it's uh, a product-related one or a service-related one. I think there will be differences, but uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Stefan? Uh, I have no idea. Um, I started my career in 88 uh, at Allianz, and um, before this, I, was, uh, I worked uh, 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 in, in a university and I was responsible for labor law and economic law and all such high sophisticated things. And Allianz asked me to walk from door to door selling insurance. This was a totally new experience for me. And um, I, I, I learned a few things during this time. When I rang the bell, it was, uh, it was important to, to, to enter the apartment. And then it was important to sit on the table and to ask the customer, the potential customer, to switch off his TV. And from that point, the customer had no chance against me. <laughs> uh, because, I, first of all, I, I'm able to sell insurance. I was well trained. I was good in argumentation. And so the customer had no expectations. Because, he, 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 well, my visit was a, a surprise for him. So, so if we... If we, if we ask whether somebody can love an insurance company or insurance products. I don't think that any of my customers loved me before or loved me afterwards. A couple of years later, in, um, in 2007, I decided to found my own insurance company because I wasn't satisfied with the, all the insurance companies in Germany. I was, I'm of the opinion that, that their products are boring, not interesting, difficult to understand, and all these things. So nowadays, I have to sell the insurance products in a totally different way. I'm not in the, in the living room of my customer. I'm not sitting on his table. I have not to ask, switch off the TV. Nowadays, I'm, I'm far away. I don't know where my customer is at, uh, during the, the, the closing yep. selling point. Um, so I have to offer a very simple and easy, understandable product. This is for me key. Mm -hmm. 
Um, we cannot differ in, in uh, I take one example, the dental insurance. We cannot differ between uh, uh, dental replacement, dental, uh, um, uh, I don't know what the dentist can do in your mouth. I, I mean, all these different types of insurance. We have to offer to the customer a, a insurance product which includes everything what the dentist can do. And this is, the, is, from my point of view, the expectation if a customer wants to buy a insurance from an insurance company which sells on a direct way. So we have to differ between, between using intermediaries, tight agents, brokers, or something like that, or if you sell the insurance product on a direct way as we do it. Mm -hmm. Here it is key, an understandable product, and yes, I agree, afterwards we should organize the claim service, not so bad. Okay, makes sense. And Given that product and, and consumer-centric approach is not anymore is a, an option, is it what you need to do? What's your view here, uh, Paul? Love is a very strong word. <laughs> I think, uh, like, I, I think is, is, for most of us, is, is probably an aspiration I think we'll need to um, figure out over the next you know, 10 years. Because I agree, Stefan, Life insurance in particular is a very emotional sale. Um, you're buying a product in our sector. You know, if I buy a policy, I'm not going to be the beneficiary typically. It's, it's my family. It's a gift to somebody else. Um, how do you create an emotional attachment when um, people are finding through Facebook, through Instagram, through a lot of these other um, venues? Um, I think we have to think very carefully as organizations how we sort of uh, organize and send and um, deploy technology into various areas. Um, you know, if, if I think uh, you know, challenges I've run into different companies is um, you know, call center. A call center may have be managed uh, as, as a cost center. I think I think we've seen a lot of cha changes there, but it takes a long time in an organization to change who manages it, the talent, you know, who was put in place ten years ago. You know, the challenges ten years ago of the person who rose to the top of, of some of these, these points need very, very different skills. So I think it is a combination. I agree, Monica, experience is, is going to be the new brand, but creating that is not a, a marketing campaign. Yep. It's a, combina a combination of an entire organization with a mission and mandate to sort of rediscover. You know, and I think uh, otherwise, I think the challenge is going to be, you know, is it easier for me to fall in love with an insurance company that gave me a watch? Or is it easier to fall in love with a company that made the watch and happens to have insurance in it? And I think that'll drive a lot of our, our, our business and our, our role with customers in the future. Okay. And what about the most exciting product developments that you're seeing nowadays? Can you share with the audience some of the good examples of what you like? Monica? Um, what, what I like is that we get into the mind of the customer and stop thinking products, but more thinking in customer needs. Yep. And, and I mean, you know, everybody talks about mobility. It's less about uh, car insurance, it's more about mobility, and how do I create an ecosystem around that? Uh, and one of the things we are talking about a lot is also, how do I increase the frequency of touch? Because let's face it also, on average, uh, our customers have uh, one, uh, every one and a half years a touch point with us, yeah? if at all. Yeah? Not in all countries, there's a renewal phase uh, in the end. Uh, so the, the, the question is also, how do we get relevance in the life of our customers that is beyond just selling an insurance policy, uh, but table, helping them the to... the table in the living room? Yes, for example. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the table in the living room uh, online today. Yeah? Yeah. So how do how do get into the mindset of my customers? And there are examples from insurance companies who even go into gamification, but it has to be, of course, relevant to uh, the customer. But then also creating services around the products that are relevant. And I think that is something which is exciting, but not easy, because we are coming from a world where we are still organized in Life insurance, motor insurance, home yep. insurance, yeah, and we're not thinking in ecosystems yet. Yeah. Thomas? What is it? Well, 100% sure if the ecosystem at the very end will solve all the problems, but I'm with you that um, a classical standardized product uh, will not be the solution of the future, especially yeah. if you want to get into a, in a, into a buying process. I think it's a combination of offerings, not only service wise, but um, 
in the products itself, maybe. Um, so, I mean, we are a specialist insurance company, so hard for us, but we try to partner up with other insurance companies uh, to offer combined products, uh, which then add a broader value to the consumer. Um, and um, then for me, one element um, is um, the on-demand topic. Um, I mean, we are still not in Europe in, in a position that uh, consumers buy on-demand products uh, broadly. Um, but uh, looking at car sharing and other topics, um, there will be on-demand insurance coverages. Maybe the entry point for the customer is a different one than nowadays. Um, and I think that's the angle uh, we should focus on. Interesting. Any other ideas from Stefan? When we started the company, we started with a combination of uh, several PNC insurance products. Uh, it was uh, accident, household, glass, uh, liability, and uh, legal protection. And um, this worked not so bad, but uh, it was really difficult to find uh, enough people who, uh, who need five types of insurance products. And uh, because of this, we changed our, or if we shifted our focus uh, on, uh, on uh, supplementary health insurance. And um, nowadays we sell, um, well, we want to sell this year 100,000 new uh, uh, contracts. And uh, we expect around about 80,000 out of, uh, of, the, of the health insurance. So, so, so we are more focused on, not on combinations, on, 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 on global solutions. We are more focused on, on, on um, yeah, easy understanding health insurance uh, products, and um, and that's that's all. I, I, I'm deeply convinced that 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 this branch is not able to become the center of any uh, uh, of any ecosystem. The customer asked for an answer for a specific problem, and most of these customers have no idea what the problem is about. So if you start the selling process, you have to explain the, the, the problem, which is, which is rather difficult because the, the, the customer wants to, to live in a, in a beautiful world and now you, you start your, your, your selling process and ask the customer, what about your family if you would have died yesterday? It's a, uh, uh, well, it's, a, it's, a, it's an emotional moment. Um, and not every emotional moment is, uh, is the beginning of love, by the way. Uh, uh, if the claim settlement does not work, it's also an emotional moment, but uh, at the end it's not love. Uh, it's more something difficult, uh, different. Uh, yeah, I, I cannot talk for the, for the branch. I can only talk about my company. We, we, offer, we, we try to offer a, a, a simple solution for a problem the customer might have. That's all. Yeah. Full stop. Very clear. Andrea, interesting product developments. Yeah, because I have quite a different view of it. Yeah. So you, I think that the, the future of our industry will be and to be part of an ecosystem. Uh, a wide ecosystem where insurance is, is part of the solution, but it's not just a simple uh, solution to one simple spot need. Mm. So, I think that what I'm really looking at the market as interesting solution is the combination of insurance plus assistance services plus IoT data devices, whatever. So this will the combination of the three will give up a new value proposition, which is not anymore. I will pay you after you get sick. I will pay your bill, your hospital bill. No, my value proposition is I will do my best to keep you safe, to keep you healthy. How? Using my knowledge, assisting you practically on a daily basis with my doctors, with technology, using devices, wearable, to, 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 to be in your life cycle of health, not yeah. of health insurance, of health. Then if I fail, I pay you the hospital. But insurance becomes like a gap option for the failure of the main promise, which is you will be healthy. And the, the funny thing in this is that, coming back to trust, is that we are very accountable when we do this, pro this promise. The customer really believes that we will keep the promise because he knows that we don't want to pay the claim. So if he's healthy, it's a win-win agreement between us and the customer. So, Any interesting product innovation from your side, Paul? Yeah, I think it's, uh, we're, we're kind of on the cusp, and I agree with, with, with uh, my colleague on the, on, on the problem side. I think it gives us a chance to 
take a totally fresh look at the problems that we're addressing. In the U.S., there's this, you know, a, a, a maximum says, look, you, people never go to this. People never want to buy a drill. They want to buy the hole. And I think with the technology and the change of, of how people are buying and how they're interacting with us, well, maybe it wasn't the hole. Was it the bookcase? You know, was it the living room? Um, I, so I think in a lot of these products, we've, we've sort of engineered these products as big sort of heavy batch process products where, Monica, I must send a piece of paper or, or data and structure a paper in and get an answer two, day, two, year, you know, two weeks back. We're, we're engineered for very large products. Um, I think we've got, we're, we've got some remarkable, remarkable opportunity, um, Luke, at, to build some micro-insurance type products that I think never could have existed <laughs> or could have made sense financially, I think they will today. So I think it's almost like I think it's given us opportunity to be smaller and more focused, uh, yet have even bigger impact in people's lives. So those are my some of these newer products. I think are the ones that uh, are, are the most exciting for us. Interesting. And speaking about that, where do you integrate, let's say, those product developments with startup digitalization in your business? So where really the starting point is for you to making sure that you can be closer to where the consumer needs actually to buy an insurance product. Thomas, any thoughts? Uh, tricky question. Um, I mean, I think the key challenge we all have got, and um, no matter whether it's an insure tech or a traditional insurance company, is really to find a different access uh, to our customers. And um, I think Everything we said right now is to a certain extent true, um, but um, if we really look at our existing business models, would we say we have nailed it and find a different access to, to, to customers and to consumers? Um, I would say no, we are still all in an in a operating phase and finding phase. Um, uh, a colleague yesterday said um, the insure tech tsunami is over and now we need to see how we can partner up and I think uh, there uh, we'll see where the, where the future lies in the combination um, of... Uh... Please, Mike, I'll, I'll ask something here. I can see you. I, really <laughs> want to. I, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, the, the challenge we have is that we have an existing organization, an existing mindset, and it's not that easy to move from A to B without some push. Yeah? Uh, and this is why I firmly believe, and we never did that in the past, in partnerships. Uh, and I don't know if you saw Inaki's presentation, Inaki, uh, earlier. Um, so Zurich, for example, partnered together with um, Cover Wallet, uh, which is an insure tech company from uh, New York. And we set up a European partnership. Started in Spain, February last year. Now uh, launching in Switzerland this year. And the amazing thing about um, the Inakin team is they don't leave us alone and ask us questions and challenge us all the time. Why do you do it like that? Why don't you do it the other way around? Yeah? It starts with things like uh, you have the call center guys yeah, that have to be much more efficient uh, than we're used to. Uh, we had to train them specifically to sell yeah, and not to sit there and just uh, answer questions, for example. Or Inaki always challenges us on product features. Yeah? Why are the products like that and not uh, the other way around? Because they have to be much more simplistic yep. and not so complicated online. Um, and then uh, where we also, I mean, where I had to convince the organization quite a lot in the beginning because most of the colleagues said, oh, it's an IT platform. And we're good in IT and we can do it on our own. Yeah? If we would have done it on our own, I swear to God, it would have taken minimum two years. Yeah? And what we don't have is the search engine uh, SEO capabilities. Uh, and SEO also helps us to see what does the customer want. You talked about artificial intelligence, so we get feedback. Uh, and if you look at the conversion rates, uh, we are now, am I allowed to say that, Inaki? <laughs> we are now sometimes up to 15%, one five from leads to sales. Uh, that, those are numbers we are not used to because we are not experts in customer and lead generation. Uh, um, we are okay, but we are not top-notch when it comes to search engine uh, optimization. And I think that there you need partner in order to push you and then also say, do it differently. Uh? Yeah. Uh, and, and I like it because otherwise uh, we're too slow. Yeah? 
Uh, and Inaki and Amanda had a breakfast meeting this morning, and the first feedback he gave Amanda is, you're too slow, you have to be faster. And I'm, I'm very proud <laughs> that we started discussions with Cover Wallet in September 2017, launched in February. Yeah? For me, this is revolution. Yeah? It's great speed. Yeah. yeah. And Inaki still says, you're too slow. And I'm like, yeah, I like that. Because we need, we need partnerships today in order to say, how can we change the paradigm? Mm. Paul, any different views here? Uh, no, I think uh, it's interesting. I think the opportunity, I think it, Monica's sort of said it right. I think 10% of the, the opportunity is technology. The other 90 is, do you have an organization that really sort of understands um, the opportunities and the possibilities? Um, you know, when I, I've been to, you know, so many different meetings, I mean, we all have with uh, our, our teams even it's, I found in, in high levels in insurance organizations, you have people at the same table who don't really understand the products and how they work. Uh, now, as you sort of fast forward to digital, well, not only do they, you know, the, the, level in, the level of understanding when you start talking about things like SEO or um, uh, digital advertising or uh, machine learning, it suddenly you get such discrepancies at different levels because people people never knew this who were in, a, in very in, in very important positions to make investment decisions. So I think you know how do, how do we survive the tsunami? I think it's um, going to require a lot of learning through a whole organization. I think that's where partnerships play a role. Not only is it getting done, but it's also bringing um, appreciation and understanding that yes, um, this type of stuff is possible in an organization. And I think company size mat matters a, uh, a lot at this uh, stage because if you're a small company or a mid-sized company, sure. it's much easier to transform quicker sure. than if you're an <laughs> uh, international group organization. I mean, I see it with our companies. We, a company, we have 300, 450 employees sitting in Munich in one building. Uh, if we talk about customer centricity, um, then we just uh, went up the floor uh, to talk to the call center colleagues. Yeah? And, uh, that's, uh, that's much easier um, to have a bottom-up, top-down approach in, in a company sitting than if you're talking about a company with uh, 450 different markets, etc. And 100%, if you are an incumbent so big, you have some legacies underneath, yeah. which do not allow you to be so, so friendly. I mean, say, using digital to announce yeah. customer experience uh, is like painting white a dirty wall. Yeah. So you, you work uh, on it touch point, but underneath, you still have your legacy. If you don't change your organization from the bottom, you don't solve anything. Absolutely. Yeah. And Stefan, any thoughts? Uh, um, back, to, back, to, back to my reality. Yep. Last year, we had 50,000 new customers. Mm -hmm. This year, we expect 100,000 new customers. Last year, we spent 15 million for sales. This mm -hmm. year, we want to spend 30 million for sales. And we are on track, by the way, at the moment. So when we, when, when we will be able to realize 100,000 new customers, we are among the 10 biggest insurance companies in Germany from the new business point of view. Yeah. I employ at the moment 115 people, 115. Allianz uh, employs 31,000 <laughs> employees. Because of this, I start every discussion in my company, and every thoughts about uh, customer centricity, all these things, nice fluffy words, I start everything with the product. For me, the product is key. The product has to be understandable. Mm -hmm. And um, if I want to make you familiar with my, for instance, my dental insurance product, it is enough to keep in mind that everything is included. And if you look on the German market, no other insurance company that offers dental insurance is able to offer a product like this. But everybody talks about customer centricity and uh, bar, Facebook, uh, Instagram, and all these things. My answer is everything is included, full stop. Which is quite an approach. Okay. I will take the opposite direction. We'll say size matters sometimes. Yeah. Yes, technology is an enabler, uh, but if you have a certain size, it can also help you to be quicker. Mm. Uh, we are now, and I'm also responsible for digital strategies, we're now building a so-called suite of services, because I've seen, if I'm talking to the different countries, 
Everybody is looking at online portals, everybody is looking at chatbots, everybody is looking at how quick is my website uh, loadable, what about mobile solutions, so everybody has the same questions. Uh, and of course not everybody has the time, the resources to build everything uh, on their own. Uh, so so, so I, I agree, I'm fully with you, it is easier to take decisions and it's easier to, to, to navigate in smaller companies, but sometimes it's also good to have a bigger weapon, so to speak. So I think it's pros and cons. And what the bigger ones have to do is uh, find solutions so that people, I mean, it's a misused word as well, can move around a bit more agile, take decisions on their own, and not be complicated in decision making. That's one of the things I would argue. Well, since I'm in the middle, so I'll say, I, I, I've worked for very large companies, uh, you know, 40,000 plus employees, and very small ones. Not this company, the prior company where we had 150, and I will absolutely concur, it's much easier to get <coughs> decisions and, and rally people. Um, that said, as Monica says, if, if you organize a large company as a small one, and you're able to keep small teams, and I think, uh, you know, I, I love Amazon's uh, two pizza rule, or at least the original, you know, rule was don't do any project if you can't feed people with pizza. Uh, I think you have a chance, uh, and I do agree with you. If you make have a large company, the huge opportunity is you've got a, a large um, cost center. You have you have cost centers to go out and, and just go and buy, uh, you know, something if you um, have the you've created the intention. Um, so I do think speed is everything in this market. I think uh, you know if companies are tr are trying to be fast followers. If you don't have a team that all can explain what exactly you're selling and what a perp what your more importantly what your purpose is, I think it's going to be really tough over the next ten years. And Monica, you mentioned Cover Wallet. Any other example, guys, of insurtech companies that, in your opinion, are doing a good job and winning customer over, and why? Obviously. So clearly, Monica, you think Cover Wallet is doing a good job, I guess, but. Uh, Let's hear somebody else. So, Stefan, any, any company that you admire, apart from yours, obviously? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, so, um, I know only my company, yes. Yes. I, I would like to say something different. I think everything is a question of leadership, by the way. Yeah. And, um, and I think many of the board members in traditional insurance companies are not brave enough to change anything because they run a business which, which, which works at the moment. And it's very risky mm -hmm. to change an existing business model because you have a vision. And what happens if the vision does not work? And, and, and I think, and I think we, if we talk about, about digitalization, about insurtech and all these things, we have to talk at the end about leadership. And my advantage is that I am the highest ranked lawyer in my company. Yeah. <laughs> because of this, we abolished the signature under a contract. Please try to do the same mm -hmm. in a traditional insurance company. All the lawyers over there are my colleagues. I mean, are my, my, my allies. Mm. And they stop developments like this. So it's a question of leadership. So no other companies that you admire, I guess. <laughs> Deutsche Familienversicherung. <laughs> Keep Deutsche Familienversicherung in mind. We, we realized an IPO last year in December. Um, um, if everybody here in this room uh, would buy one share, uh, the share price would uh, go up. So I, I would be the happiest man of the day. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will look into it. And by the way, I fully agree with you. Yeah. I think leadership is very important. Mm -hmm. yeah. Paul, Thomas, Andrea, yeah. any any other companies that are you like Stephen, to mention? I, I, I agree with you to, to a certain extent, um, most probably because we have got the same background as Allianz, uh, maybe a, a few years in between. But um, I also started selling insurance at the kitchen table. So um, I'm with you. Leadership is a topic. Um, it's about the passion and uh, the willingness to change and how, uh, exactly. how much risk you want to take. That's it. And if it's your own business, you can take more risk. If and and how young the board member is. Yes. And if it's a smaller company, <laughs> If it's a smaller company, um, you probably are more risk willing, you can push mm. it harder. Yeah. So, uh, just one example, uh, it's an example of my company. We founded uh, two years ago a completely digital insurer in Austria. 
Um, it's a different brand, not LV1871. It's called LIV, L-I-V-V dot A-T. Um, it's pure digital chatbot technology, a new brand in a new market. Um, so our little internal uh, startup, if you want to say so, mm -hmm. five people running it. And we have been able to try everything, on-demand insurance coverage, day coverage, weekly coverage, monthly coverage. We launched products within six weeks um, from decision taking point to launch the product till it was in the market. And um, then it's again the lawyer topic. Um, if you haven't got the constraints and the legal ones, you're much faster. Um, and I think that was, uh, that was quite an experience for our company and it helped us really develop the core company. And uh, now after two years, uh, we are trying to get all our products online in our German core market, which, uh, which was a hard shift in the mindset for the people and still is um, with regard to customer centricity, even mm -hmm. if it's, it's a fluffy word, uh, coming from a traditional life insurance company, uh, a call center is not used to reach out to the customer and give advice. Mm -hmm. um, if you put them on a pure digital player um, in a different market, uh, they learn quickly and they bring the knowledge back into the core company and then you can really speed up. Um, so we are kind of sitting in the middle between the big ones and what Stefan described um, um, with his company, I'd say. I'm sorry, I'm so inspired okay. again right. by you. <laughs> There's one thing I believe is very important um, and, and I saw that in our company as well. If you go to, oh, this is online and this is digital and this is insure tech and this is good and the old world is bad, I think that you get into a lot of resistance. So what we try to do also with Cover Wallet is that we combine both worlds. So in Spain and also in Switzerland, we are combining online call center and the agent community. And I think that is also a big trick because mm -hmm. what I learned is if you say this is good and this is bad, yeah, then you're getting into this black and white uh, picture which sure. nobody likes. Plus there's still a huge potential also in, in the agent world. Yeah? Let's face it, nobody goes completely online directly. Yeah. Give the customer the choice so that they can decide what they want to do. And then you can shift over time and then also adapt your business model. But I think it's not good to get into the black and white no. picture. Yeah? Fully agree, especially because most of our premiums today comes from physical agents. Sure. Yes. So yes. we cannot just disintermediate them. Um, so the resolution, I agree, is the interoperability among channels. Yes. So. Yeah. Any other interesting companies. ideas, guys, and companies that you have? So, only a few. I, I, I think I, you know, I'm, I'm seeing like uh, just some, some terrific energy going to uh, some of the startups. And this is a hard business. I mean, anyone who's sold insurance that's Online. If you've sold it in a per to a person live, that's hard, even harder to do this digitally um, with the products as, as they are today. But um, I think in the U.S., Health IQ has done a great job um, creating affinity with cyclists, runners, very, a very health-conscious uh, uh, group. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a, a company called Fabric uh, in the U.S. has done a very interesting job of, they've said, well, you know, it takes a long time to apply for life insurance. It's difficult. Why don't we start with simpler AD, uh, just accidental death coverage and sort of almost like the old sell term, convert it to a permanent insurance. They've sort of taken it down a notch. I think they've seen some success. Um, I've seen some real innovative startups. I think, you know, one one's here, uh, uh, came through one, uh, an ex our startup boot camp uh, group in Hartford, uh, Pineapple, or a couple of people, at least one person here uh, doing some really novel things on the, on the PNC side. Um, it's just, this takes a lot of work. How do you engage people digitally? I think, um, you know, I think we should all do our, you know, I think to your ecosystem, I think it's, these companies will turn into the distributors of the future. How do we work with them? How do we build product for them? How do we build services? So I think it's a, um, I, I think it's, we have a tremendous opportunity with, to work with a lot of these, these startups to understand how to shape our products and our services so that we can uh, keep growing over the coming years. That's great. Thank you. I think we're running almost out of time. Maybe a couple of, of questions from the audience. Does anybody that has some question for us? Here we go. Hmm. The, the, the first one looks interesting. What technology are you using to understand and improve customer experience? Any volunteer here? No technologies? Monica or Andrea? I mean... 
we, for example, using the uh, Medallia platform to do our NPS service, uh, uh, and there we are using dashboard technologies right now as well in order to give people the opportunity to understand better, to slice and dice, to look at the customer segmentation. Yeah. Um, but to be honest, I think the second question is also pretty important. So, Richard, <laughs> do you want to say? Do you want to say something? What you did? Your whole program. Yes? <laughs> What did Zurich UK do to increase <laughs> customer satisfaction so massively and how long did he, he it Here's the star in the this middle of uh, yeah. the room. Yeah, who did it? Stefan can, can answer yeah. that. So, I mean, Monica, you gave the answer already. I mean, a mix, a whole mix of things. Go on, you say. They, they can't hear me. I mean, uh, I mean uh, there's, uh, there's been a big issue of trust in insurers and uh, bad financial services uh, uh, companies in the, in the UK after the crisis, uh, financial crisis of 2008. I mean, we already talked about this uh, earlier in the in the set. With uh, um, the insurance scene is very low trust. Um, when you ask, it, even about something so basic as keeping your promise and paying claims, um, we advertise around we pay 99% of claims. It's not new. We've been doing this for years. Um, we had very strong scores from um, uh, consumers who realised that actually, um, uh, you know, you can trust us. Actually, you should trust us to uh, to be there for you when something goes wrong. So that was one part, um, making, um, we improved a lot on our customer satisfaction through, <coughs> oh gosh, we worked with Spixi to put a new chatbot in, uh, very high claims um, satisfaction because we reduced <coughs> the amount of time taken to make a claim, um, which made a big difference to, um, I think, 25% uh, of claims, home and motor claims going through Spixi, uh, um, Zara chatbot um, is never a magic bullet, yeah. um, but certainly changing perception and making sure that the story <coughs> of what we're doing is linked through to the reality is got to be, you know, the heart. That's great. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank, Thank you, Richard. Sorry to uh, put it on you. <laughs>